my first sukkan. So. <laughs> Done a few user group talks on related developer experience um, topics, and so I'm really excited today because now I actually get to talk about how all the things I've said in those other user groups are things we're actually building here at Zycor. So um, I called this the future of developer experience, and then I felt that that was like way too ambitious, so I just kept this working title thing going. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but so this is sort of just an outline, a sort of principled outline to how we're approaching developer experience at Sitecore, and particularly with XM Cloud. Um, me, generally quite new to Sitecore, I've been working in the headless CMS space for um, five years. I'm almost at a year at Sitecore. Um, I've been a React developer for a long time. I also have a CS degree in AI and machine learning, so I'd love to talk about AI. Um, and then just my hobbies and things of that nature. Let's see. So um, we're going to talk about why should we care about developer experience, what developer experience is. Um, and then I sort of want to, I don't know, a principled approach to how we should be holding each other accountable for the types of developer tooling that we're building. Um, and then actually just get into what Sitecore is going to be building. So why should we care about developer experience? Most of us here, I think, are developers, so we care about it because we like to build things. But um, developer experience oftentimes typically talk about productivity. Um, what is it? There's this uh, Stripe survey a few years back, the developer coefficient sort of laid out that 42% of a developer's time in a given week is attributed to technical debt and bad code. Um, and good developer tooling and good developer experience can bring down that number. And so not only can developers care about that, those productivity scores, but obviously they have incredible impacts on our organization's faster time to value for the tools that are being, for the you know, websites and experiences that are being implemented by our developers. Um, there's also a good developer experience allows developers to learn new tooling quicker. Um, and you know, the ability to change our stacks, change the tools that we're using, and, and do that in a productive fashion is, is one of the things we're going to value about a good DevEx. But DevEx isn't just about productivity. Um, when we can take away a lot of the challenges that can come from a bad developer experience, we can lead to more creative, innovative outputs. And so we want to get beyond just the productivity conversation with the developer experience, lowering costs and being more efficient, and really talking about the innovation that we can get to um, in, in development practices with tools that focus on good DevEx. And then, selfishly, um, those who love their tooling become advocates for the things they love. We've got an entire community here today that you know, have, have built up a practice around Sitecore and, and have valued the developer experience that um, has been invested in, in, this, in this brand and in this community for quite a while. So we care about the advocacy, too, that eventually comes from building good tools that people love. Um, so what is developer experience? Um, you know, I think most of us developers, it's like things we like, but um, it's user experience for developers, but we have a lot more interfaces that we have to think about. We've got our UIs, but we also have CLIs and APIs and SDKs, lots of acronyms here, right? <laughs> um, but developer experience is, is also sort of broader than just the products that are being created. And I think really thinking about this end-to-end -end developer experience is what, how we're approaching things at Sitecore. So it's also docs. Documentation is fundamentally a DevEx product, and, and we need to be doing better and investing more in, in our documentation. I think we have some great stories around that that we'll share. Um, but it's also the content. It's the content being created by Sitecore and by the broader community. The amount of like blogs in this ecosystem is massive, right? And then it's the community. It's Slack channels. It's this meeting right here <laughs> that we're in today. Um, and so how, how do we think about how, you know, developing this end-to-end -end developer experience? Um, Sean Wong, who is a DevRel at Netlify, sort of introduced this idea of um, the radiating circles of DevX architecture. Um, and I really like this framework. And so I, I sort of did as an exercise thinking about developer experience with regards to XM Cloud. And so, you know, what, what, are, what are all of the interfaces in our product? How, how is that being surfaced in our docs and all of our content channels and then in our community? Um, and so we talk about this end-to-end -end developer experience. 
And then we think about all the features and kind of doing a feature map of all the features within XM Cloud um, that are a part of a developer's journey. And what this exercise aims to find are the, the sort of cross axes, the themes that we can orient ourselves around in terms of how we define a developer experience for XM Cloud. Um, and so as I started kind of moving these pieces around, I, I, the two axes that I, I kind of landed on, and I'd love to get your feedback on this, is the notion of developer tools regarding head app application development, so our, our headless front-end development experiences, and then all of the ecosystem around authoring extensibility. Um, and in XM Cloud in particular, there's a challenge in the authoring extensibility side, right? Which is that we need to be surfacing new patterns that are less about developing directly in the CMS and more about utilizing new kind of headless composable patterns. Um, and so if we start thinking about all the tooling that you need, I kind of start dividing there. The other division, and I, I think fundamentally one of the more meaningful ones, is that we can't just be, you know, building for the demo experience, for the easy getting started experience, because the developer's experience is almost, it's better predicted on what happens when there's an exception, on good error handling, on, on what happens when you're down that unhappy path, and you need to reason about your systems observability, monitoring. Um, and so this kind of, well, I can really like breathe into my mic too much. <laughs> so we, we sort of land here, right? There's this developer experience that you have to learn about the core XM Cloud product. Um, but then happy paths for front-end developer, we're thinking about onboarding and front-end development. On, in the unhappy path, we start thinking about how, how do I debug? How do I performance tune? Um, and then for authoring extensibility, the same thing. We're thinking about happy path, integration building, and custom content resolution. Um, and then more system monitoring, security, things of that nature. So <laughs> this is where we land on this concept of the radiating circles of development experience, right? When, when we want to think about product development for developers, this is, I think, an interesting framework to kind of position how we think about things. What are we building? for the happy path, for the unhappy path, for the head application developer? How are we making sure that the products speak for themselves, but that there's enough docs in place, enough content being surfaced in the community, and enough community to help and support each other? Um, let's see, okay, so, <laughs> next slide. So, um, Microsoft Research and GitHub Research kind of combined a three key metrics report they came out this week, with, uh, this week, this year about um, developer experience. And so the three key metrics they kind of landed on are feedback loops. Um, so what is a good developer experience? It's not just the tools you love to use. It's not just the thing you always know. Um, but it's things that give good feedback loops. So that I know when something goes wrong, but I also can build something and it, it builds quickly. A fast build tool allows me to have you know, a, more communication back to me about, about what I'm building. Um, so we're. You know, we are thinking about error messages, um, links to docs in place, observability, logging, things of that nature. Cognitive ease. Um, this, this idea that your tool is intuitive and it's reasonable, that I can kind of, I can make sense of what's happening in a way that is common industry practice um, and that, there's, I don't know, an easy onboarding so that it, it doesn't take too long for me to learn a new tool. Um, and there's this sort of psychological notion that cognitive ease breeds creativity. The less anxious you are around the kind of act work that you're doing, the, the easier it is to be creative and innovative. Um, and then flow state, like don't interrupt me. <laughs> Developer work is, needs to be concentrated. Like the better deep sort of work we do, uh, with fewer interruptions. And what does that mean for product design? Oftentimes it means limit context switching. So if I'm a front-end developer and I'm building my component system, having to switch context and go into the UI in order to do you know, uh, component template building is gonna be a, a shift in context um, that it oftentimes is gonna kind of bring us out of being able to, to work productively. So let's move on. <laughs> It's not 2024 if we're not talking about AI. Um, so what, what do we want to think about when it comes to AI with regards to developer experience and how are we thinking about it at Sitecore? Um, 
one thing I, I like to use a statistic, but like uh, developers, we've been using AI, Gen AI, just a bit longer than everybody else because we've been using GitHub Copilot for a few years now. And um, and Stack Overflow survey last year, 56% of professional developers use GitHub Copilot. It's, it's become a sort of integrated part of a lot of our development practices. Um, and just kind of briefly, once we start thinking about AI augmented development and how we build, um, we're starting to see new patterns emerge around generative UI and design to code. Um, there are really interesting patterns around function calling, this ability for an LLM to be pointed to functions and actually do work on, on our behalf out there in the ecosystem. Um, and so when we're thinking about developer experience and how we're building things, you know, some of the techniques that are surfacing that support AI, a lot of testing, a lot of kind of schema validation in order to avoid the hallucinations and other aspects of AI. Um, and then streaming is becoming a fairly interesting pattern, right? Like AI takes, an LLM takes some time to give a response. So how do we incorporate more streaming into our development in order to um, get things out to users faster as an LLM is thinking? Um, so I go to all this to say, what should we expect from our developer tools? And um, I kind of land on this five steps of developer experience principles. This is the way I'd like to approach thinking about product development um, for a DevX. All user experience product rules still apply. User research, validation, feedback, right? We, we, we empathize with our, our customers, our developer customers. Um, design for simplicity, design for exceptions. This is the notion that the unhappy path is more important than the happy path for a full DevX experience. Reduce the feature learning curve and evaluate the features by those DevX metrics that we just talked about. So same user experience rules apply. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I like this quote about uh, simplicity. So the general problem with ambitious systems is complexity. It is important to emphasize the value of simplicity and elegance for complexity has a way of compounding difficulties. So what does design for simplicity mean? Um, simple names that are explicit and concise, simple patterns that are reasonable, simple exits that are frictionless. When I don't want to use the opinions of my SDK, how do I get out of them? How do I get out of them quickly and in a way that um, doesn't cause too much headache? I want simple debugging experiences. We should, notice, we should note, though, that good DevX should never be at the expense of good UX. We don't put in client-side libraries that are like really fun tools for developers, but that slow down the user experience. Um, magic and black boxes aren't simple. They're merely hiding complexity in a way that takes away control from the developer. Um, they might have really great happy paths, magic, but their unhappy paths are incredibly challenging because you don't know what's going on inside of them. Um, and then one thing to really note about AI is that AI is a non-deterministic magical black box. It's really, really hard to reason about. <laughs> and so how do we start thinking about tools for AI that um, allow us to reason as much as possible about this new experience that's being fed into everything we're doing? Um, so black box concept. I have a lot of slides in here that are really just for the community to like review afterwards, so I'm going to kind of skip through a bit. Um, but, you know, when do you need a black box? Typically when you're hiding intellectual property or you're abstracting a lot of complexity and underlying architecture. Um, and the typical rules prior to AI was that you want a black box to be deterministic. No matter how many times I put in an input, I'm always going to get the same output, right? And then you sort of reason about a good documented relationship between inputs and outputs, and then you might not need to know what's inside the box. It's just hiding the function but understanding the relationship. Um, but with AI, <laughs> you kind of, you lose a lot of the, the, the reasonability here. You put in a prompt, and you can put in the same prompt seven times, and you get seven different outputs. Um, and so we're thinking, you know, in terms of developer experience in AI, how do, you, how do you help the fact that none of us are particularly strong prompt engineers right now, because it takes time to figure out how these models work. Um, if we all think back to like early Google, uh, learning semantic search was difficult at first. You know, it took time for people to learn how to get the sort of search results that they were expecting out of Google in terms of the keyword prompting. Um, and now, Gen AI is a much bigger challenge when it comes to that prompt engineering. So I don't know the answer to this, but it, like I'm thinking about it a lot, which is how do we surface, I don't know, 
suggestions to try to help reason about prompt engineering and, and what you're putting in and what you're getting out of an, of an AI and really, you know, interrogating that experience in a way that's, that's useful for us to, to build tools on. Um, design for exceptions, I think we all sort of get that. A greater development experience is predicted by the unhappy path features. Um, and so let's not over-index on getting started experiences when we, when we build developer tooling. Reduce the feature learning curve. So this is a big challenge for us, which is how long does it take to learn the core features of your product? Should only take a few hours. Could, could we say that right now about XM or XM Cloud? Um, how long does it take to learn all of the features of a product? It really shouldn't take more than a few days. And so how can we invest in doing a better job in that? Um, and then each kind of tier of that radiating circle should speak for itself. The product itself should be reasonable enough. But then, if you need it, you go to the docs, and the docs should be good enough before you have to go out to content and you have to go out to community. And so holding each sort of level, um, I don't know, accountable for the quality of itself is, is a challenge I'd like for you all to kind of hold us accountable for. Um, and then, like I said, and then we're going to sort of think about evaluating by these DevX metrics, feedback loops, cognitive ease, and flow state. So, this is my sort of proposal for our principled approach to DevX product development. Uh, so now, what are we building? <laughs> a bunch of stuff. <laughs> like a lot, a lot of stuff. Um, but I just want to say, like, so those axes, we're thinking about front-end development and then authoring extensibility. And then we're thinking about how do we design for the happy path, the unhappy path, and the kind of depth of docs and content and community. Um, so, let's, and then authoring extensibility, same thing. Okay, so framework strategy, I, I think we've talked about this a little bit in other arenas, but one of the challenges we have right now in XM Cloud is that um, a, lot of, a lot of the framework strategy around it is built around features of Next.js, um, and, and JSS in particular, certain features of, Oh, I just lost my train of thought. Okay, so <laughs> certain features of um, of our starter kit are, are only really compatible right now with the, with, with Next.js, and so it, it's our sort of approach that we want to offer um, uh, more, 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 more options, more frameworks, more um, more opportunity to to do development the way your companies and your customers are asking for it. So becoming agnostic to style systems, becoming agnostic to uh, a, a lot of the ways in which you, you develop. So we've got a kind of two-phased approach here. We're right now we're in the middle of phase one. Um, we're, we're, you know, our development teams are already working on this, which is coming up with, um, yeah, I'll actually dive in on more slides, but so we're gonna first, we're gonna simplify and modernize what we have right now in terms of our starter kits and JSS and just do some improvement activities. And then we're talking about um, expansion and sort of investment in a, a more open source community involved uh, way of doing things. So, um, JSS and the starter kits, they do a lot of work to support visualization right now and experience editor and pages. So this crazy diagram that we have up here is the, the, the actual sort of editing and caching mechanism in order to support visualization and experience editor and pages. Um, it, is, it is heavily reliant on middleware and caching layers that right now in meta frameworks really only supported by Next.js. Um, so, how do we expand outside of just the Next.js only approach to pages? We take all this stuff out, we rip it out. We put it into pages itself, and we allow pages to control its own visualization. Um, once we do that, there's like these amazing benefits that come with it that I'm really excited about. Um, when we take this out of the starter kit, it reduces the complexity of the starter kit, um, but you also no longer need a framework-specific approach to visualization. So right now, anybody who's familiar with JSS, you have React component version and Angular component version. You will need none of that. Um, you, because the, the visualization will actually happen in HTML on pages, which means that we now, we're refactoring JSS to be totally agnostic to any front-end framework, um, which should open us up to really any kind of framework development that you're looking for. Um, also, 
There's some cores complexity right now in pages. I don't know how many of you have run into cores errors when working on the, or editing hosts, but um, all of that goes away with this change too. It's pretty, pretty exciting. What is one of the benefits of those cores complexity changes? Straightforward local development. Right now, front-end development, um, you'd either have to use local containers or use NGROC tunneling or you know, use these local storage overrides. All that goes away. You can take pages, point it to your local dev environment, and it, and it immediately works. Um, so the target here is that in less than 10 minutes, you're going to be able to deploy a starter kit and immediately start editing like live written code that goes into pages. I'm so excited to demo this once this is ready. Um, but this, this is, this is going to be in, incredibly valuable, I think, in terms of you know, positive front-end development experiences. Next thing, leaner, modern starter kits. So recognizing that there are a lot of use cases in which those who want to work in, in the CM and those who want to do front-end development may want to do that separate from each other. So separating out the head applications and the authoring environment, allowing me to just do front-end development if I want, just work on a local CM instance, um, or do them together if, if I need that. Um, but one of the other things about our starter kit work that we're doing is we're going to take out a lot of the complexity out of the starter kit. So if you've spent time in, in the XM Cloud starter kit, there's a lot going on there. There's, there's build, build time files that are being generated. There's library files that you may or may not want to touch. It, it creates a lot of upgrade friction because you, you have to kind of manually go in and change all the things that have been changed in the XM Cloud starter kit. So we're pulling that all out. We're moving that all up into SDK level and getting as lean of a starter kit as possible to allow you all to just do whatever you want and it not really conflict with what you may need in order to implement an XM Cloud uh, front end project. So, and again, the style system agnosticism too, I think goes a long way to, to uh, I don't know, reaching, reaching many, many different development practices. Cool. And then the one thing I'll talk about is we are going to build new starter kits, not just for Next.js Pages Router. Um, but when we look at where we want to point our attention to, I keep coming back to this notion of like content is static and experience is dynamic. Um, and you want a framework as a marketing company, to, you, you want all of it. You want experience, you want content that's built ahead of time and cached and immediately available. You want to be able to stream AI features, but stream any kind of personalization experience that's happening on server runtimes, edge runtimes, client runtimes. And we're making our framework, our JSS, totally runtime agnostic too. So you can run on an edge runtime or on a server runtime. Um, and if you look at that pattern of what you might need for a full marketing experience, something that's static and dynamic and server and edge and client and streaming, you see a pattern that's starting to emerge. Next.js app router is the first one to really land on this, which is partial pre-rendering. Nux is calling it streaming islands, was Astro. But this pattern of doing everything all at once um, has, has a lot of value. And so we want to go there next. So, we're going to build a Next.js app router as soon as we're done with this cleanup effort, and then we're going to work on Next 3. Um, and we recognize that that is going to be a path that I think is going to hit a lot of our customer base's needs, but it's not going to hit everybody. So we're going to build for the 80%, but we want to provide pathways for anybody who, for whatever business reason, needs to be working. You already have a developed Angular practice. You have a deep .NET Core you know, practice. You, you're, you're not going to come on that journey with us, but we want to be able to support it all. So with this work we're doing in phase one, we are taking so much of the complexity out of building a starter kit that we want to encourage the community to build anything they want on this more simplified platform and really recognize that um, it, it's going to be simpler, but we're also going to invest in docs and how to build your own starter kit and community involvement. We want to make an investment um, in anybody who wants to build an open source starter kit. Um, and so there's a really cool session, I think today or tomorrow, on, um, on the Community Astro Framework, which is built way ahead of any of this work. Um, but we want to incentivize more of that. Um, and so, you know, R&D is ready to invest in like some architectural consulting and creating some dedicated community channels for those who want to build um, an open source kit. Um, we're, we're, we've got plans of making a more active GitHub presence. 
um, other things we're going to do, we are open sourcing our .NET Core SDK, and we are actively inviting community contribution to that. Um, <laughs> yeah. We're also looking to add out-of-the-box personalization support to that SDK ourselves. Um, and then, you know, this, this new strategy to pages and, and JSS means that, like, if you want to go on bi and build on Blazor, you can, because it's going to be simpler and, and all of that visualization is still going to, to work in pages. Um, so, the one other thing I'd kind of mention in terms of front end development is a recognition of some component strategy challenges that we have right now. So, um, please check out Christian Hahn and Sebastian Winter's rock off session about this because they go into way more detail than I have time for now. Um, but, you know, right now we're, we sort of surface two different alternate alternative code-based component plans, plus we've got our low-code component builder. Um, and so we recognize that this is a bit too much complexity. Um, and so I think, you know, hopefully the Rockoff sort of reasons about much of this, but we're looking at an evolution of code-based components where SXA and BYOC become a single compatible, backwards compatible um, feature set that, that does surface the notion of component registration, which is one of the cooler things about BYOC at the moment, which is that you never have to get outside of your development practice in order to build front end, front -end code. So um, this is work that we're undertaking right now and I think should have a pretty meaningful impact to the XM Cloud strategy. Authoring extensibility. So we owe our community, I think, some new patterns for um, extensibility. Some, some ways in which, you know, the XM Cloud advice is do not customize XM Cloud. Do not go into the CM and, and do, you know, work there and deploy custom code, custom configuration. But we need to surface meaningful alternative patterns. No. <laughs> um, well, the, the, the entire brand and the entire sort of enterprise, I don't know, pushes for the idea that you might want to do your own path and you need patterns to emerge here. So um, this is still very much ideation phase. I just kind of want to share this with you. I'd really like to get your feedback here about whether you think these patterns would suffice in a lot of the uh, use cases in which we're seeing customization. So where do we see that custom content resolution? Um, either by writing custom resolvers or working in integrated GraphQL. So what are our proposed alternatives here? An external data service, edge functions that are deployable where you can do any con content resolution on the edge, um, and then you know, uh, bring your own data source kind of patterns for, for registering external data. A much improved authoring API um, and, a, and an SDK around that to allow you to do any kind of like batch processing work in, in, in different patterns than are currently available to you. Um, Non-visual content in pages, so this is an often heard request about edit frames, though edit frames are sort of one of the reasons in which people are still maintaining their experience editor practice and not moving on to pages. So we've got some pretty cool plans. Um, it's maybe not an equivalent to edit frames, but it is going to give you all of that ability to uh, use you know, non-visualized data and edit it, um, and, and then also provide uh, third-party plugin architectures for different different kinds of uh, experiences one might need in pages or in other parts of our, our, of our services, um, as well as uh, an application marketplace so that we can share the work that we do in terms of plugins. So that's product. Documentation, what are we doing? Um, so as we said, we're really solidifying this notion that documentation is a DevX product. Um, we're working right now on XM Cloud to update the information architecture. There's been changes now where um, our SDK references, our JSS references have been separated out from the, the core documents. Um, we're also, we recognize that XM Cloud, we've sort of just ported over XM Docs into XM Cloud. And so we've been working on a removal project of really just updating for XM Cloud specific documentation in in um, our docs. Content, um, I just want to shout out that the Sitecore Accelerate program, if you haven't checked out um, the, the cookbooks on Sitecore developers, it's, it's amazing. It's a set of best practices around XM Cloud. Um, it, it's, it's really the place for development practices around XM Cloud to be codified. And then community work. Um, so as I said, 
we're really focused on this investment in R&D and open source. Um, and that means things like uh, having dedicated support engineers for, for GitHub issue triage, um, in, in introducing discussion moderators. Um, we are starting a front-end developer user research group. And, um, and then working on monthly meetups, architectural consultations. I'd love to talk to you guys more about this. I'll be around for a bunch of time. And then the last thing, um, we recognize that our new stack is sometimes a change for people and that we need some kind of front-end enablement around our web stack, TypeScript, React, Next.js, GraphQL. Um, so we're not gonna be the best experts in web development learning. Um, but Friend and Masters is. And so we partnered with them to create these custom learning paths just for uh, UN, uh, U, UI web development. Um, so we've got these two custom learning paths that really cover the majority of our, our stack. Um, right now, we have opened this up to our internal employees and we're doing beta testing on groups of customers and partners to see if this is meaningful and helpful. Um, if it is, hopefully we can you know, introduce this to, to a wider offering. Um, but it's a recognition that in order to you know, carry on in this change, we also need to provide all of the kind of learning opportunities we can to, to, to move along to this. Um, and so that is my sort of end to end, everything we're thinking about in DevEx. Um, I'd love to hear all of your thoughts. Thank you so much. <laughs>